All right, and good afternoon, everybody. Again, my name is Nelson Santini from Tridal Proposal Management, and I'm here to talk and direct today's webinar on Oasis Plus, a pursuit update. We're gonna get started, and uh, for the attendees right now, uh, Vincent, if uh, you can hear me well, if you have any questions, please make sure you actually just direct your questions to the chat box. I'll be actually just doing the presentation, and if you have any questions, you know, I'll be glad to answer them as we go. No need to hold them all the way until the end, but in the end, we will also have a Q&A session, right? This is a pursuit update, actually sponsored by Trident Proposal Management. Some key takeaways for the presentation today is, number one, start to capture early. You'll see that the government is actually sliding the, uh, sliding the capture, I'm sorry, to fiscal 23, Q1, and Q2. So they're pushing it slightly to the right based on the things that are happening in Polaris and other entities. So start early, although you have some time, but start early. Uh, also, if you're a small business, evaluate the possibility of teaming up, you know, if that is actually a situation that you want to go through so you become more competitive, right? Um, make sure that you actually identify yourself as a company that is easy to work with. That's one of the key themes uh, for capturing here in Oasis Plus. And, you know, make sure you work on your pricing strategy. It's one of those things that we've noticed that in the latest uh, release uh, and news that came out on the 12th of this month, you know, a couple of days ago, uh, pricing, you know, again, is not necessarily part of the evaluation uh, up front, but it'll be part of the considerations that the uh, government will have as they evaluate your company uh, to join Oasis. Uh, just a brief word about Trident Proposal Management. It's a complete in management and proposal house that was actually founded in 2008. It's a veteran-owned small business out of California with employees all throughout the United States, uh, Europe, and the Pacific, uh, specializing in four major categories, pipeline management, capture management, the proposal writing itself, and then coaching. So this presentation falls under the house of capture management and coaching as well. If you're interested in more services and learning more about Trident, our sponsor, please take a quick look at tridentproposals.com. Uh, your speaker today is me, I'm Nelson Santini. Got you know, about 25 years of experience in capturing business in the federal government with over $2 billion in IDIQ sales and direct opportunities in the back. Uh, I'm an avid sales operations blogger, so if you have any questions related to this capture management effort, other IDIQs, or sales operations in general, and how basically a Trident can be of help to you, please feel free to hit me up at nelson at tridentproposals.com. The agenda for today will be a brief uh, review of the OASIS timeline. So we're just going to look at what are the latest news on that. Basically, the qualifying process, how it's going to work out. I'm going to inject in there uh, a couple of comments related to the latest news. Like I said, you know, we actually had a couple of documents come out on the 12th of the month. So a couple of days ago, and I want to make sure that you are familiar with them and that you can go and find them out. Uh, then we're going to go into uh, how to prepare for the joint ventures and um, mentor protege programs. So you guys can consider that if, in fact, based on the qualifications standards, you know, it becomes a challenge for you guys to actually just you know put yourself in a position to qualify for Oasis. After that, we'll just have a QA and a session. We'll wrap up and we'll join, you know, business again uh, after that. So with that said, you know, welcome to uh, th those folks that are coming on board. I would like to let you know that this presentation and the video will be available on our website at trendproposal.com forward slash Oasis. And also we will have the tools that we discussed today or the segments that we discussed today in a simple location so you can find them, you know, and use them for your reference. So with that said, let's just get into it, right? And if you have not followed, you know, Oasis, let's just do a level setting in here. It's going to be a new services MAC, multiple agency contract provided to expand professional and human services capital throughout the, the federal government. It's for best in class providers. And so this is where the government begins to inject keywords and tricky phrases. Best in class means that they're just looking for the, the you know, the best people to this uh, to uh, basically um, deploy these services and work with the government. So that what's the the written message or the under message underneath this particular phrase is the fact that your company ought to have the processes and controls to make sure that they can actually just do work with the government in the best way possible. The contract itself is organized so that the the KOs and the cores can actually uh, issue task orders in the easiest way possible. So you'll see that uh, how the contract is organized allows the cores and the KOs to basically just not finagle, but basically have more wiggle room, if you will, to include NAICs that otherwise may not be specifically included in one kind of solicitation based on an area or the other one. So they're going to have flexibility on how to employ the budget and also how to basically bring NAICs to the task orders that they will be throughout the IDIQ, right? So it's one of those like multiple agencies 
budget concentrators that actually uses multiple NAICs so that the KOs and the cores can actually just issue the task orders to the entities that are basically bringing the business to the contract vehicle. It's officially known as Oasis Plus. So if you've been following this, uh, it was Oasis, then it was a services Mac, then it was the Big Mac, no pun intended, uh, or trademarking of reference in there, but now it's called Oasis Plus. So I strongly encourage you that if you have bots, if you have RSS feeds, if you have your podcasts that are tracking news and or other events or less lectures about Oasis, that you look for the Oasis Plus hashtag, which is now the official name of this solicitation. Uh, why Oasis? Because quite frankly, it's a big IDIQ. It's a 10-year IDIQ, which is a five plus five, five on the base, five options, all for professional services, dual track. We have a small business and an unrestricted uh, path. Uh, and it's going to be grouped in different domains. So you're going to find that those domains basically have the same flavor and, and makes, if you will. Uh, and it's going to have all kinds of awards, anything from firm fixed price, you know, to cost plus, to time and material task orders. And it's size right now, right around $50 billion. So it's quite a, you know, quite the size of an omnibus, if you will, of a contract vehicle. So incredible amount of money, you know, going through here. And it goes in line with the trends that we've observed where the government has concentrated other contract vehicles and replaced them with one larger contract. And so Oasis happens to be on that category as well. Uh, and thank you for slowing down. I'll definitely will do that. Appreciate, you know, for the comment uh, and make sure that you, um, you know, if, if you have any questions, by all means, please slow me down. Let's talk about the timeline. So it's going to be a, a long vehicle, right? It's going to be a vehicle that is going to be uh, led first as a draft on the last quarter of this calendar year. And as a solicitation, it's going to be led on the first quarter of next year. So you're looking at between October and December of this year for the RFI draft to be led. And then you're looking for the final RFP to be led somewhere between January and March. And that is so that the government can do the evaluation uh, in the latter part of the summer between June and August of next year and begin to do the awards in such a way that the contract or the incumbents of the new Oasis can take as, and assume responsibilities uh, for those that are being off ramp of the previous Oasis contract. So you're looking here at least a year worth of capture. Um, and that may give you a sense of security, meaning we have time. My strong advice is that you think that uh, it's better to prepare early and to build your strategy, go through your due diligence now, and then I have more options later on than kind of like leaving this for later uh, into the uh, year, November, December, and then finding yourself on a scramble mode trying to respond to Oasis. So still a lot of time ahead. You no, know, as I'm pointing out in the chart, we're in August 14th. We're just right before the period where the draft RFI is going to come out. Expected and last update is that it's going to be after the beginning of the fiscal year. Then the original solicitation or the final solicitation, I should say, will come out between January and March of 2023 with evaluations and awards you know, happening in the latter part of the summer, sometime after June, all the way through the end of the fiscal year, and then beginning the formal transition and onboarding such uh, that, um, again, those contract vehicles uh, that are being elapsed in for favor of Oasis can be uh, transferred and those task orders can be transferred to Oasis and the new incumbents. So that's the latest timeline that we have. Um, as far as what to expect between now and the end, uh, we expect to have multiple industry days uh, in which the government will be asking questions from industry and collaborating. And uh, as a former Oasis awardee, I have on board, I onboarded my previous company on Oasis. I can tell you that this was one of the great tools that we had on the capture bag, being in front of the team, working with them to craft the solicitation, to craft their requirements, and also to make sure that we were in alignment and known as people that were in compliance with those um, alignments, not just on the re regulations, but in our capabilities as well. So participate as much as possible in those industry days. It's an investment in capture that will pay off in dividends. Uh, we expect that we'll have multiple RFIs and RFPs, right, for the domains. Uh, and so expect that, you know, we're gonna, you know, go through that process that it's gonna be iterative uh, for the different you know vectors as far as small business versus regular business and also for the domains and um, how they're going to be actually just let out and the last thing to remind or to mention here is the fact that the grading is going to be like on a scorecard um, and so if you're not familiar with this uh the, the latter idiqs that we've been working like for example polaris is one that you know has had this mechanism is the fact that we're going to have a standard chart now uh, that is going to be uh kind of like awarding points for different requirements so it's fairly metric driven as far as 
how you basically score your points, how you can prove your points. And then after that, the remainder of the evaluation will be obviously by that selection board. But it's kind of like based on how many points you can accrue to prove to the government that you are a easy to do business with and then that, that you're a low risk uh, you know, uh, mem uh, kind of entity to participate from a multiple um, agency contract, you know, of this particular magnitude. So expect it to, to be iterative, a lot of information being exchanged, and it's going to be somewhat protracted. Um, again, longer process. Also expect the fact that there's going to be some jockeying around. If you've observed other contracts like Polaris and other IDIQs that we've seen, there's always a little bit of a back and forth between the legal teams. And so dress yourself with patience because this is not going to be necessarily a sprint. All right. So that's the general view of Oasis, you know, north of $50 billion over 10 years for services uh, for small and large businesses. Uh, so fairly substantial um, award there that based on points accrued on a scorecard. I'm going to basically just touch on the scorecard a little bit later on. But on the domain approach, and what does that mean, right? It means that you're going to have some NAICs that are going to be grouped uh, in basically blocks, if you will. And the name for the block is the domain. Right. And so this will allow you uh, to basically pursue, you know, uh, within that domain uh, that it basically includes that NAIC, all of the other NAICs that are kind of associated. Right. So if you look at the way that they're grouping the NAICs, um, there may be some adjacencies of services that are related and complementary. And what you know, the, the reason they have done this is such that let's say that I have a NAIC that is on professional services for staffing. Uh, there may be an adjacent NAIC that may be professional services for staffing in a specific, a specific area. Even if you don't carry that NAIC, you may be able to participate in those solicitations uh, that carry the other NAIC that you don't have on your SAM record or, uh, or similar you know, classification. So it allows you to expand and pivot from one NAIC that you have on your registration and your uh, reps and certs to basically participate in other task orders. This is, again, part of the flexibility. So in, in short language, if you're in the domain X and you carry uh, NAICS B, as I'm articulating here, you're eligible and you may be able to bid on other task orders that have, you know, NAICS A, C, D, E, right? So this is actually, you know, what gives you the flexibility of participate in other task orders that, you know, you may have been classically ex uh, excluded from, but that you may want to expand, you know, into once you're inside of the veil of Oasis Plus. The other th reason why, you know, the government has done this and they have stated that, you know, uh, this as much is that they want to group the NAICs in a way that they can actually just look at uh, budget tracking for functional purposes, right? So the, the two reasons here are to make it easy for budget tracking. And number two, and primordially, it is actually to make sure that the cores and the companies have flexibility on what they can bid or they can't bid. So a clear example that it's not necessarily on services in some other contracts, for example, myself as a systems integrator, I may have had a NAICS in my profile, which was for the development of technology. And then I would have, I would have wanted it to bid on basically technology that was commercial off the shelf already. It, that would have been perhaps a bit of a challenge with both NAICS being on the domain. I could have been able to bid, you know, back and forth between those two NAICS so I could have expanded myself in the footprint and those who basically had the different NAICs would have been able to bid on my contracts. Again, it's just for flexibility. So that's the first one on the domain approach. I'm giving you here some examples and you can see that there are going to be two major groups. One of the groups uh, on the domain is going to be for uh, engineering, research and development, logistics management, some facilities. And you can see you'll have some Intel environmental entities and for enterprise services. I've coded those in orange because if you've been tracking the news, you can see that those are going to be uh, projects and, um, and functions that are going to be funded by some of the le le legislation that has been very recently approved, right? And if you go look into the group number two in finance, you know, I'm sorry, group two, you will have finance, human resources, admin, and social services. Again, a lot of money in there that is being injected that's going to have to be disbursed and managed. So, you know, expect that, you know, those uh, sectors and those uh, groups in orange, you know, you know, are not to be slept on, if you will, right? So classical, you know, uh, Oasis and the contracts that we're consolidating here are your engineering, R&D, logistics, management, uh, and finance, right? Look at the other uh, elements in service to see if those are, are, you know, of interest to you and or you basically could qualify on those up to provide those services, right? So that's kind of like the domain's approach that Oasis is taking. As far as the scorecard, 
and again, this uh, and this uh, going to be a weighted average. Uh, it's very much what has been done in Polaris. And so, just last week, we got the first peek at the um, at the scorecard itself, or the draft, if you will. Uh, and we will have that one on our website at tridentproposals.com forward slash oasis. I'll make sure that that is posted. But basically, uh, I'll, bas I'll walk you through what the methodology is, which is the scorecard has several factors and the factors are gonna be weighted. So factor A may be account for 30% of the points, factor B for 40%, so on and so forth, all the way to 100% of the point structure, right? And so when you're looking at um, the different uh, at the different blocks, based on the number of responses that you have on a particular factor and its weight, you come out, come out with a combined total. Uh, if I looked at the chart correctly, and again, you'll see it, you know, it's we'll have it posted at Trident Proposals, uh, it focuses on past performance. Uh, and again, I'm going to touch a little bit on what a qualifying contract is, but it focuses on, uh, on major elements like what's your past performance? What major uh, proposals have you had that are of substantial value? By that, you know, our, our material like greater than a million or $10 million, depending on different categories. Do you have your uh, controls uh, for your corporation, for your finances? You have your controls for project management. Um, have you been able to expand from a contract and grow and accommodate for a large growth that was not forecasted at the beginning of a contract? So you'll see that all those factors have uh, the options that, you know, can tell you what are the past performance examples that you can use to qualify and how many points you will derive all the way down to uh, elements. Uh, for example, if you have a qualified CAS system, if you're certified to carry uh, um, clearances uh, within your organization, so on and so forth. So everything has a point to it. And that's how you're going to basically stack your points to get to a minimum qualifying level. And the government will determine what that minimum qualifying level is below which you will not be able to compete. The people that basically meet the minimum threshold will then be stacked together. And given the, the number that's available, everybody will qualify or the government will make a determination on how many seats they'll assign. So that's kind of like how the methodology works in this particular solicitation. The purpose of, of this stacking is again, for two main uh, points. Number one, are you a top tier provider? Uh, worthy of a Mac. And so BIC, you know, best in class, Oasis is a BIC Mac. You know, that's where the, the funny name came from, which was best in class, multiple agency contract. Am I top tier? And the second part is, are you ready? You heard me talk about your capability to expand, your capability to search, your capability to modify. That speaks to, do you, you have the right controls and tools within your system? And then am I a top tier? That is based on large contracts that have been well executed with good CPARs and or reviews from the customer base, right? So spend some time as you're preparing to go into the capture, making sure that you have a good system and policies that your certifications are up to date and that you can actually just back up your experience. By certifications, for example, I mean that if you have a CMMI certification, make sure that you've actually just met all your requirements for renewals and or the latest inspection. So, you know, if you actually just have to bid special services or if you have folks on board that have to carry certifications that all of your folks actually are up to speed on their certifications and such, right? So focus on systems and policies. Do I have those? Am I good to go? Number two, uh, do I have my certifications? Are they up to date? Check. And lastly is the experience vis-a-vis -vis the projects and what I call them the QPs, the qualifying projects that are gonna be um, used to garner the, the heaviest part of the points on the solicitation. Uh, so specifically, what are the QPs, right? You know, for the uh, for this particular um, capture, 250K is the individual TO level. So solicitations that are less than $250,000 probably will not get, you know, a lot of attention. I mean, uh, I should say below 250, they won't, but you know, in the vicinity of 250, they will get little attention. So you're looking for what are my largest task orders that I can use. And I'm looking at a five-year window of direct labor, uh, the time that, you know, the solic solicitation is actually just let. So look, look for those uh, solicitations that you have to put them on a window, if you will, so you can begin to stack what are my qualifying projects greater than 250 and where you have provided my services so you can look in a calendar to make sure that you fall within that window so you can use them as a reference, right? Uh, look for your CPARs. Make sure that you actually have those in a place 
uh, where you can refer to them and use them because they're going to be uh, required for reference. And if you don't have them, you know, make sure that you're beginning to work with your prime or your actually just uh, awardee at, uh, awarding authority so you have your CPARs. And the key thing here is that you must pick five QPs from a minimum of X. And so what the government is saying here is that they would like for you not to be uh, uh, basically um, having your only five qualifying projects be the ones that you reference. They're looking for five or your five best qualifying projects from a pool of uh, qualifying projects. So the moral of the story, double stump, is make sure that if you don't have multiple qualifying projects, perhaps you ought to be considering teaming up so that between the two or three entities that you basically have a good qualifying pool. So very important to start looking at your past performance now. This is just a, a short graphic and I'm just highlighting here with my A and, uh, and the um, exclamation point is for you to look at basically a five year window. So again, very important for you to make sure that the last portion of service provided falls within the five year window. And this is just to articulate that qualifying project one here, the last piece of services provided, you know, is within that five year window, hypothetically speaking, uh, that the submission was actually March 30th or 2023, whereas qualifying project number two clearly doesn't meet that. So it's just a very simple way to make sure that, that when you're doing your stacking, organize your projects and you can begin to see, you know, what's going to be at risk uh, or what may actually fall within the window for qualifying for OASIS+. Plus. Another key element when it comes down to the um, to the scorecard methodology is that it's going to be actually just factual based. So it's not just going to be on opinions. So expect that, you know, the second layers of the qualifying scorecard will basically tell you specifically the things that you have to prove within your CPARs. So when it comes down to the number of heads that you manage, the number of heads that you expanded into as a, re a result of a surge request, the revenue that was recognized, all of those things have to be part of your evidence to prove. It's not just basically uh, for you to say the qualifying project was of $5 million and we did services in this particular NAICS, you have to be able to prove that from the NAICS that are qualifying that you were at, you can attribute the number of dollars and revenue that were attached to that particular NAICS. So very important for you to go through that uh, process of stacking your qualifying projects, breaking them down, again, just so you can reference them and uh, figure out which ones are the ones that you would like to use as you enter them into the system. So put some elbow grease into that to make sure that you have your information handy and available to actually just enter into the government's database. One point that I wanted to make when it comes down to the pricing data, uh, it's typically overlooked. Uh, and quite frankly, it's not one of the overt requirements here um, in the solicitation. But if you look at the fine print, if you look at actually uh, a little bit beyond and you basically uh, are in a place where you think you're going to be winning Oasis, the, qual the, the pricing that is going to become obviously uh, an element uh, of uh, evaluation. So make sure that you have your catalog, you know, in a, in a way that is just easy to audit, easy to actually present to the government, easy to manage. And more importantly, going back to the previous comment, that you have your processes and procedures to control the pricing catalog so you can refer to them. Um, I have not seen exactly all of the reading uh, that came out on the sections B, H, and ECHO uh, here in the last, you know, uh, let, you know, from the government from about three days ago. But I expect that we're going to begin to see guidance that's going to speak into how process procedures and controls are going to be evaluated for the purposes of points and qualifying into OASIS Plus, right? So to be straight up, pricing is going to be evaluated at the task order level. But what is going to be likely referenced, and this is just in the, in the capture work that we have done and just looking at what's all throughout the industry, that it's very likely that the pricing procedures, processes, and controls may be referenced in the scorecard. And again, I just want you to be aware of that and ready for it, as the case may be. Uh, lastly, and one of the other vectors uh, on Oasis, you have two pools, very self-explanatory. You'll have the small business pool and the unrestricted. The one thing that I will share is that the government has not made a determination yet on how the small businesses pools are going to work. So we don't know if it's going to be super granular and will have different legs for hub zone and veteran owned and woman owned and small business, um, you know, uh, vanilla flavor, if you will. Right. Or if they're going to group just like they did on Polaris, where we actually had legs in groups of small business and woman owned and then hub zone and veteran owned. We just don't know how exactly how it's going to fare out, but we know at the highest level, two tracks, unrestricted small business. So 
be looking at your partner agreements, your opportunities to team up, and then let's wait until the government comes out and basically says how what the tranches will be for the small business if you fall under that category. Uh, this is actually the point that I was making here about you know uh, whether all uh, the small businesses are going to be lumped together. That's a possibility. And then on the other side of the spectrum, there's like super granular. We expect that there's going to be some slight grouping just to facilitate you know and not to fall into micro segmentation. I'll come back on video for one second. There it is. Okay. So um, a couple of things, you know, to think through uh, and to actually just to consider uh, as you move on forward is that, you know, de depending on how you stack points, you may want to consider a mentor protege or a joint venture. And the good news is that you still have plenty of time and plenty on runway to actually just establish these identities, right? We know that they're going to be in the mix. We know they're going to follow up uh, on the lat latest precedents on Polaris. And basically uh, what that means is that it's likely that the joint ventures and the uh, uh, MPs or team agreements will allow the past performance from any of the uh, parties to be referenced and used as a qualifying for the small businesses, right? So the world is watching Polaris that is actually just moving on forward. And we expect that Oasis is going to follow exactly the same precedence on MPs and JVs going forward. For your benefit, I've actually just put together a uh, couple of uh, slides that basically have the, the definition of these entities uh, as far as U.S. code and how to refer to them, you know, within the FAR itself, right? Um, I'm going to basically let these be there. I'm not going to uh, cover these one by one. Uh, but in, in summary, you know, there are two ways to look at, you know, how we actually just work on the teaming agreements, right? And versus the, um, the joint venture. And I want to get to that particular slide here. So it's actually a, for you to consider as a business between going with a joint venture approach and, or just doing the teaming, right? And it all depends or it hinges into if you want to, for example, look at you know referencing your past performance and just claiming that past performance for future growth or if you're happy and or content to basically let the past performance be actually just attributed to the joint venture itself and who the prime was on that joint venture so just looking at you know at the um at the complexity you know to set these up uh, and what's the value and return which is qualifying you know it all depends into what you see as your next chess move after you qualify for oasis because both of them the joint venture and or the teaming will allow you to basically steer your business through um through oasis it all depends on what you see uh, yourself doing within the next five to six years and or you know how you uh, what will be the next chess move if you will after you qualify for oasis what do we want to go or where do you want to go from here so i put together those slides for convenience you can actually see the references to the uh, the far and to the u.s code this slide is more than anything just to kind of like give you a good place to start from and looking at okay is a joint venture going to be something that uh, is better for me or is it a uh, teaming agreement something that is better for me. And the final advice here is to make sure that you check in with your contracts team, with your leadership, so you can sort out, you know, and align the pursuit of Oasis in the greater context of what you're looking forward to do with your business, right? So here for your convenience, so you can take a look at it. I see here that there's a discussion litigation comment. And I, um, I want to say, Vincent, is this actually just related to the litigation on team and agreements? I want to come back to this comment here. And uh, I'll wait until you come back on the comment, but I'll, I'll make it a point just to look at that question one more time. All right, uh, key things to keep in mind, you know, when you're looking at team and agreements and JVs, uh, they take time to put together. And so if you start now, you, you, you'll have plenty of time to get these going on, but make sure that you start early working through these processes, make sure that you look at all of the factors and how you wanna organize these together. They do take time and money, right? And the key thing that the government is going to be looking for in here is more than anything was there established relationship between these companies two or three that are forming this joint venture right have they do they have synergies have they worked before together and are they going to be a good fit for the government so by all means pursue these it, it's going to take some time but you know if you can you know look for the opportunity of working people that you have worked before because that's where the government is looking for. Can they work together? Are they a good fit? You know, did they have success together in, uh, in the past? You know, or are they new entities that are just forming just for the purpose of this solicitation, right? It's an investment, you know, start early and have a plan. And again, if you're looking for independent parties to review these, just like Trident and other entities can help you do that, just put, put a capture plan together and evaluate if you're, you know, if your teaming basically has a good chance of success, right? 
Um, last, you know, set of comments related to Oasis as actually the keywords and tricky phrases. So when you're looking throughout the solicitation, look for targeted representation, tier three, best in class, look for easy to do business with commodity versus service pricing. So all of these are just different, uh, different ways that the government is actually using just to telegraph some flexibility into the, into the selection process, which may be good uh, for the, for the, um, the bidders. And so what we mean by this is by targeted representation, there may be room in there for some folks that have actually just some, not necessarily the highest scores to be pulled into qualification to provide diversity when they're looking for best in class. Again, uh, they may actually just using this, uh, to the discretion of the government to break a tie, if you will, between folks that have that similar score or they're right in within a block uh, um, of tier. So look for these things with the solicitation so you can craft your messaging and craft also your qualifying projects. So you can show again that you're a best in class, you know, and that you're actually just going to be, uh, um, uh, a good contributor to this solicitation from the government. Okay. Thanks. I just know, uh, I want to take a quick uh, side over here. Uh, and the question was, uh, you mentioned a litigation, please explain more. What are the concerns? Will all these uh, slides be available after the presentation? So yes, the slides will be available after the presentation and I'll just give you the URL. As a matter of fact, you'll be directed to the website and they'll be up uploaded there very shortly. Uh, the concerns on the litigation. So specifically I'll address, uh, from this perspective, uh, in Polaris, uh, the government, uh, was actually, uh, there was a, a protest, if you will, in, in the solicitation because the government allowed, uh, made a concession and allowed the entities that are within a JV to use the past performance to justify and to basically back up past performance for, uh, the joint venture participants, right? So for example, uh, what that means is uh, if I'm a large company and I team up with a smaller company, the government is allowing my past performance as a large company to actually just be considered as part of that of the team. And, uh, it, there's the perspective that, you know, and some people thought that in fact, that would defeat the purpose of basically having a small business set aside because the whole point of the small business set aside, it was to protect and give the chance for small businesses to bid and qualify and to compete by allowing in a joint venture, uh, that it's bidding on the block for the small business to basically team up and use the past performance of the, uh, of the larger company, you can quickly see how, you know, insert here, the name of a blue chip, you know, and just, you can pick anyone has a, who has a project of 20, you know, $20 million uh, over five years, uh, with two or three surges can stack all those points and transfer them to a team of a, you know, of small companies, right. Uh, that otherwise would have not have that past performance. It, it cannot, it cannot be perceived as tilting the, the playing field. And so the government has already spent all the time, um, in evaluating Polaris and they, they're using that as a precedence to basically model their language, if you will, in the contract vehicles and what they allow on other solicitations like Oasis. So, uh, that litigation is complete. We don't expect it uh, to be rehashed in Oasis, uh, identically as it was. Um, because the government, you know, will likely take the same language that they use and their lessons learned and move it to this particular Mac, uh, and, and henceforth. So, uh, it's not set a law, but we expected that they're going to fo follow the same rules. And if anything, you know, if there's a protest, which, you know, could be again, depending on how the, um, the solicitation is written, that the government just still plows ahead because they already have set the precedence that members on a JV. Even if the small company doesn't have the past performance or any past performance, the past performance of the members of the JV can be used as a reference. And so if you have, if you want to discuss any further, glad to do so on a one by one, uh, and just basically just share more knowledge on that one. But uh, that's basically what that means, uh, as far as the, what the litigation was and the resolution. So, uh, the last piece of knowledge that I'll leave you with in actually where you need to be thinking today is how to prepare for it. So strong advice is to make sure that you go into a bid, no bid, no matter how you know ridiculous it may sound, do yourself a favor and do a bid, no bid on this solicitation. If anything to understand, if this is a must win, what are going to be the other projects that may be impacted if this in fact is a must win, right? 
We all have limited resources. We all have actually just limited time to respond to these solicitations. So do a bit and a bit in the context of the pool of opportunities. And if I'm going to bid Oasis, what's going to be the impact to other solicitations that, that I have out there? Do I need to have an elastic support and proposal team to carry on with the regular business to do this particular you know, job, for example, right? So just bear that in mind and do yourself a favor. A small bit, no bit would not actually just, you know, hurt. Then the next element is, is how do you incorporate it into your business plan? So start with a bit, no bit and, you know, and take it from there. Once you decide that you're going to bid it, make sure you identify your capture team, begin to work early, identify your qualifying proposals or qualifying projects. Make sure you stack them and then you rank them so that you can more easily just look at your points matrix and figure out how you're doing within your points. So establish your capture team and commit them to do work on this regularly so you're not trying to basically hammer this out in the last week of the solicitation. Evaluate your team situation. Look at, you know, who you're going to team up with so that you can complete and score the highest points on your matrix, right? So when the government is giving you the matrix, and again, we'll have that posted at tridentproposals.com forward slash oasis. When you go and get that solicitation, you know, and you do your, I'm sorry, your that scoring matrix and you look at it, depending on where you are on the point, you may want to team up with people that help you show up where you're short. So use that as a reference to figure out what are the ideal candidates so you can actually just have a better success of qualification. And the last thing, you know, to recommend here on the preparation is build your budget for in-house and the 1099 pool, meaning that you're going to have some resources you're going to have to commit. And you may have to basically just go outside to actually, so, you know, complete this solicitation or have your internal team work on the Oasis and have a 1099 group work on the other solicitations, right? Just because you're handling Oasis, this isn't, doesn't mean that you're going to stop with all the other solicitations and all the other bits you're going to have to put together. But I can tell you that bidding Oasis, it's something that's going to be taxing, you know, um, again, whether you are a... A small business or you're a large business, uh, it's uh, it takes work, right? You know, you're gonna have to basically just put together a lot of research uh, and you know, basically putting the bids together, even as lean as these are. Make sure that you budget, you know, for some expansion for some 1099 work, and also to protect your internal assets. People who are gonna be on the technical side of the house, or people that may be helping on the pricing side of the house, so that you can actually just you know complete your proposal without interrupting the normal work of the company. I think I just went through this list, uh, and so again, just some good suggestions to organize your qualifying projects, rebuild, and just look at your pricing catalog. You know, which again, it's from the perspective of procedures and control, is gonna be the most important one. Make sure that you take your NAICS into account, update your SAMS record, make sure that everything's properly filed so that you actually have that onto your, uh, onto your record, digital records so that um, you're current. Organize and find your CPARs. If you haven't, make sure you have them requested. If you have a CPAR that is less than stellar, probably the best time to challenge those and to make the corrections so that you have them available for OASIS. Make sure you look at your certifications. And again, so those are the corporate ones and for individuals as well, so that you're current on all your reps and certs. And again, in looking at your systems, procedures, and documentation from the perspective that the government wants to make sure that they're working with people that is easy to do business with, and they're the best in class at what they do. So with that, you know, I'm just going to pause here and actually just look at the a screen and look for any other questions that we may have. Uh, Kevin, Vincent, uh, any specific questions that you may have that I may be able to answer while we're online? Okay, I see, oh, I see a little typing here. Okay, I'm going to be standing by. Here to answer any questions you may have. Okay. I see that we've uh, removed the hands from the keyboard. So it, it looks like um, we have answered your questions, you know, and if not, uh, you can always hit me up at uh, Nelson at tridentproposals.com to learn more about Oasis, how to get ready. Please uh, go to tridentproposals.com forward slash Oasis. In that page, you'll find out a resource page, will, which will have presentations, videos. We'll have some resources, including the latest documents out and specifically the latest draft of the uh, scoring matrix. So I'll make sure that the, those are posted there. Just give us until tomorrow and you'll see also the video of this presentation if you want to go back and reference to it. So no worries. You know, I'm looking at the, the, the box to see if there are any other questions. You're welcome, Vincent. I appreciate it. I hope that the lecture today or the, the webinar was useful. And if you have any more questions as the time goes, please feel free to, just to hit me up at again, Nelson at Tridentproposals.com. 
If there's no other business to discuss, I hope that you have a fantastic rest of your day here on Wednesday, that fantastic end of the week. And again, we're here to help you out. So thanks a lot for attending. Please make sure to subscribe and follow us at tridentproposals.com forward slash Oasis. Thank you so much, and I'll see you next time.